Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love to see in the comment box where we have people chiming in from. I'm sure some of you have stayed on from the previous talk with Bruce Damer, and some of you will be coming on new. Um, so let us know where you're coming in from. Thank you all for being here and also for being patient. Uh, we've had a cute few technical difficulties. I think the entire internet and everyone is, we're, we're learning how to adjust to this virtual uh, social framework. So we really appreciate your patience with all of this. Looks like we've got Germany, Denver, um, Seattle, Wales, Brooklyn. Wonderful, thank you all for being here. Um, so, I'm just gonna go over a few things on, on where everything's situated in this, in this virtual room. Um, on the bottom right, there's a chat box. You can uh, comment in there and connect with each other. Um, and on the very bottom, there is a specific tab that says ask a question. This is gonna be where, where you'll want to ask questions for the Q&A. Um, and not only can you ask your questions there, but also you can vote on questions that other people have asked. That's helpful um, in prioritizing questions for us because we may not be able to get to everyone's question. Um, today, we're going to have a one hour fireside chat with Dennis McKenna and Luis Eduardo Luna, um, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A, and then there'll be a 30 minute breakout session. Um, following that on the next Saturday, uh, April 11th, we will have Paul Stamets and Wade Davis coming on to speak. And the following Saturday, April the 18th, we'll have uh, Rupert Sheldrake and uh, Ralph Abrams, Abrams speaking. And so uh, stay tuned. These are going to be some really amazing conversations as we honor Terrence's legacy. And we really bring that momentum forth into the world today. Um, let me see if there is anything else we need to talk about. You know, I think at this point we're ready to welcome on Dennis McKenna. He is a pharmacologist and the principal founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Um, he is a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute. Um, he organized the ESPD 50 conference in 2017. Um, and his work has been really foundational in the scientific exploration of ayahuasca as well as many other realms. Um, Dennis, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna bring you on and give you the stage. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks, Genevieve. That's wonderful introduction as usual. Uh, just a minor uh, minor correction the 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 guest on uh, on the 18th is Rupert Sheldrake and his last name is Abraham Ralph Abraham so if you're googling him that that will come up but uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce and discuss Terence and uh, and many things with my very good friend Luis Eduardo Luna uh who i have known for many years and and perhaps terence has, has known him even longer uh i'm going to read a, a little um let me see i have a bibliography here i'd like to give you a little background uh so luis is the director of wasi waska um uh center for integrator in, integrator plants visionary art and the study of consciousness located in Florianopolis, Brazil. And Eduardo is a prolific author and probably the world's expert on ayahuasca from the standpoint of its cultural and ethnographic content. He's the author of Vegetalismo, Shamanism Among the Mestizo Populations of the Peruvian Amazon, which came from his uh, doctoral thesis published in 1986. Later, he published with Pablo Amaringo, Ayahuasca Visions, the Religious Iconography of a Peruvian Shaman. Eduardo and I have a long history of friendship with uh, Pablo, which we'll be talking about. And that was published in 1991. He co-edited with Stephen White of Ayahuasca Reader, the Ayahuasca Reader Encounters with the Amazon Sacred Vine, which was originally published in 2000 and now is available from Synergetic Press in a new, much expanded and very beautiful edition from Synergetic Press. He co-authored uh, with Rick Strassman, Slavic 
I won't even try to pronounce it, and Luis and Edi Frexka of Inner Paths to Outer Space, Journeys Through Psychedelics and Other Spiritual Technologies. In 1986, he founded with Pablo Amaringo the Usco Ayar Amazonian School of Painting in Pucallpa, Peru. And he's lectured worldwide about Amazonian shamanism, altered states of consciousness, and has curated exhibitions of visionary art in several countries. Luna has over 40 years of experience with ayahuasca in various contexts and as an anthropologist and with all of the syncretic Brazilian religious organizations that use ayahuasca as a sacrament. So, Eduardo, welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. And I, I am one of the few people that gets to call Luis Eduardo. Just... And I'm sorry, it's a habit. He likes to be called Luis. No, no, no. no my friendship no, no. is no. so old. <laughs> that it's my just family, my family called me Eduardo. You know, my, my brothers and sisters called me Eduardo. So, Eduardo, okay. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, like, I'm like your brother, so I get to do that. But the world knows right. you as Luis or Luisa Eduardo. Because it was easy, easy. Easier yeah. to say, Luis than Eduardo. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for making the time. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's late there in Florianopolis, but... Uh, it's okay. How are you? There was a few Fine. things you uh, wanted to bring up. Uh, one might be a good place to start, might be uh, our mutual friendship with Pablo Ramaringo. I, I don't know, probably most people listening to this conversation know who he is but why don't you tell us a little bit about how you met him i introduced you to him in 1985 when we were there together so that's a there's a story right there let's 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 open it up and talk about that to start with okay perhaps the story a uh, short one is that we went to see him and i realized that he knew very much about the amazonian tradition i mean i had just I was about finishing my doctoral dissertation uh, for the uh, Department of uh, Comparative Religion of Stockholm University. And so I, I, I knew, I met a lot of vegetalistas, I was into the plant, the cosmology and so on. And I realized Pablo knew all, all about this. Then he told me that he, was a, he had been a vegetalista, but he had stopped taking ayahuasca for seven years. So, so, so there was a reason. And then when he shows us these landscapes, I had just read, um, well, I have read uh, some years ago, Rachel Domatov, um, the, this book, um, Beyond the Milky Way. Rachel Domatov, two white paper, uh, paper and pencils of many colors and went to the Barasana Indians in the Vapes in Colombia. And as the, the Indians, to paint whatever they wanted. And what came out was this, uh, it, it, it was uh, Yahé visions, because uh, uh, Rachel Dolmatov realized that all the iconography among the Barasana and other to kind of uh, uh, indigenous groups was all based on their, their uh, trips, you know, let's say, <laughs> the, the journeys to other worlds, and as well in the narrative, everything. So Rachel Dolmatov was, one of the anthropologists who realized the importance of Yahé, I will make the decision later, among uh, 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 Amazonian tribe, you know, Amazonian indigenous group. So that was very important. So I had that in mind. So when Pablo told me that he had been a vegetalista, then uh, I asked him, do you remember the visions you had when you were a vegetalista? And that's what he made the first two paintings. You got one and I have the, the other one. And yes. I went back to, yeah. Let, let me stop you for a minute, uh, Eduardo. Yes. Um, increase your volume a little bit. I'm seeing uh, things in the chat okay. thread that you're uh, a little bit low. Okay. I or have turn me down. Here. Someone says, or turn me down. I <laughs> see. Okay. Hard to turn How me down. I'm Maybe that's, to the, in, to increase the microphone. your volume a little bit. I can't, I don't know how to do it here. How okay. To increase the, the output. Let me see. Oh, sorry. Uh, oof. I will have to go okay. here in just a moment. I'm going to um, okay. all sound just and then. Uh, okay, well, I have it at maximum. 
I'm sorry. I can hear you. I, I can. Okay, I cannot. I can be yeah. closer to the microphone, perhaps. That's it. Okay. 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 So sorry so, to interrupt. Go on with your story. So well, so I I took the I took my painting. He gave one to you, one to me. I went back to Helsinki. I was then living there. Took a photocopy of it and sent it to Pablo. Well, I, I sent him some paintings because he wanted some paint, some some paper and paintings and so on. And uh, and so I took a photocopy and I said, "What is this? What is that?" You know, because I didn't understand. I some of the elements in his paintings were very very. I knew them. You know, angels and and warriors and 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 certain serpents and so on. So I knew that, but there were elements which didn't make sense, including a UFO. So I I I. I I sent him a, a letter and the description came back. And for me, that is very crucial because it's the first time that we have, a, 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 well, you know, the two paintings, a, 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 two ayahuasca visions and the description of who are these people that, with names, you know, with a, you know, I realized this is a gold mine because by, we continue, I continue providing him with our materials and everything and, and making him questions. So he was answering uh, my questions with more visions, and you know, so so it was the extraordinary beginning of, of something completely new because uh, it was the first time that we have somebody. And the, very important is that you realize, people realize the complexity and the richness of the iconography of a humble man in the Amazon. A humble man who, you know, just like many other mestizos, and realized through Pablo's work that it is all this is also in the minds of many of the people there in the Amazon. They look, uh, you know, mestizo, you know, but they are into another cosmology. Many of them, of course, you know, they are losing culture and all that. But anyway, there is a substrate there, which for me is animistic. And we can talk about animism later. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, as you say, his iconography is shared in this mestizo, vegetalismo tradition, but Pablo was able to give expression to it. This was the exactly. amazing thing that he was actually, and so together you collaborated on this book, Ayahuasca Visions, the religious iconography of a Peruvian shaman and your explanations with every facing page of the paintings, which you dissected in great detail. These were not just imaginings. These were a sort of explications of the tradition. So that book, in, to my mind, was the one of the most significant contributions to making people aware of ayahuasca in the West, because it was an accessible book. When it came out, it, it was beautiful. It was, you know, many people bought it. Anyone who was interested in psychedelics and knew about it bought it. And I think it was very important for, in the same way that Wasson's article in Life magazine in 1957 made the wider world of you know aware of magic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. I really think that this, your book, which came out in 1991, was it? Yes. Yes. So before that, there was no, there was very little ayahuasca tourism. What we call ayahuasca tourism uh, now. There was, it was none. of interest there was to none. a few anthropologists, a few botanists. As you and I know, we both worked in the Amazon in that area since 1981. Tourists were not part of the picture. I mean, it was very rare that occasionally there were always people who were ahead of the curve. But I think the tourism phenomenon, for better or for worse, was was probably triggered by by the publication of that book. And that got people curious about it. And then yeah. they travel being what it is, they could go down and see for themselves. And, yeah. you know, we know yes, that ayahuasca know. tourism know. is a double-edged sword. There are definitely exactly. uh, good exactly. things about it and not so good things. It's had a social impact. Um, like anything, you know, yeah. yes. Okay, so. Can, can you raise your volume? I, I still can't okay, hear you. Okay, I am again. I am again. I'm hmm. trying to, I, I don't know. I don't know what loud. the problem is. Okay. okay. Um, 
Yeah, so so you and I received those two paintings, which I were one of, for myself and I think for you, probably one of the most cher cherished possessions that we have. And we've sort of been stewards of those of those objects of art for how long? Uh, you know, ever since 1985. And you and Pablo went on, you went on, you worked very hard to make Pablo world famous and by arranging exhibitions and so on. So now we've come to a point where we both have decided that uh, we want to sell those paintings. So you and your son have created a, a website, is that right? To sell those original paintings and a number of others. Yeah, okay, well, trueamaringos.com. Trueamaringos.com. Two of yours and one of mine, or two, two of mine, I two. guess. True, true. Verdaderos. Trueamaringos.com. What, what is the uh, name of the website? Trueamaringos.com. True Amaringos. True.com, yes. Amaringos. Goes. Dot com, I guess. Yes. So if, if people want to look at that. Oh, there you are. Okay. 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 Well, let's but let's, let's, go, back let's up. talk about Terence. <laughs> What's that? Let's talk about Terence. About let's talk Terence. about Terence. Exactly what right, I was going right, to exactly. say. So yeah, yeah. all of this yes, took yes. place. You know, I did yes. not. The, I did not meet Eduardo until 1981. I was a graduate student in Vancouver, working on my PhD, which was ayahuasca, and he came to a. Uh, anthropology conference in Vancouver. That was the first time I was able to actually physical meet him, physically meet him, but I knew about him because he met Terence in 1971. Some of you are familiar with Terence's uh, story. We went to La Chirera, we did the thing that everybody talks about, but not everybody realizes that after La Chirera, Terence actually made a second trip into La Chirera. Later that year, spent a lot of time there, actually started writing what the book that turned into The Invisible Landscape. He began the, uh, you know, the, the book on that second trip. And on his way out, he, he and, and uh, Kume, his girlfriend, Erica, went through Florianopolis, which happens Florian, to be... Florencia, Florencia. Florencia, Florencia, sorry, Florencia, <laughs> yes. right, right. In You're Colombia. in Florianopolis now. Sorry, right. I'm confused. No, <laughs> you went through Florencia, which is your hometown. And just a chance encounter in a cantina, I guess Terence was trying to order a food <laughs> or something in his horrible Spanish, and you introduced yourself and said, may I help you? And the, that was the first encounter. So why don't you tell us about that and what what happened? He ended up, they ended up staying at your at your finca for a while. And uh... okay, it was like, the story is like this. Um, um, well, he he had been to La Chorrera. He had nobody to talk to about these things. You know, I, I, suddenly you found some Colombian. I mean, uh, although. I have left, uh, I have not been in Colombia for seven years. I went for holidays when I met Terence, but suddenly, you know, somebody who he could speak to. So he was, you know, an avalanche of ideas and there was Terence, you know. So, and he said that he was going next day, he was going to Bogota. And from Bogota, his idea was to go to Peru. Um, and then he told, told me about Yahé. And uh, that night I went to see my, my father and I told him that I met this gringo uh, who, who was talking about Yahé, and I was very interested. And and then my father said, tell your friend that he doesn't need to go to Peru. Uh, Yahé is right here, it's right here. Uh, because um, um, in Florencia, okay, Florencia is, um, it, it was a tiny little town when I was born. It was no, there was no running water or electricity and, and um, but it was created by the missionaries, Italian missionaries. And then there were still indigenous tribes going through Florencia from time to time to buy to buy some things, you know, uh, some clothes or or um, salt or getting other other things. And my grandmother had a little shop, you know, just tiny little 
place in Apollinar, you know, the the the, the Ingano shaman used to go there. You know, the Indians used to go there to to my grandmother's shop, and I was very interested as a little kid, you know, because they had a hole, you know, the males had a hole in the nose, and and I was uh, you know, see if I could see the light on the other side of, of the hole in the nose, and 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 anyway, so for me, uh, Apollinar, I knew him all my life, you know, since. <clears throat> so, so, um, so, okay. But Apollinar was living in the, uh, was in the in the forest. But um, we met um, uh, one of the, the, the Villa Gloria, where is the uh, little country house that my my parents had. Um, okay, now this the story is he went to Bogota, went back to Florencia because I told him he, you don't need to go to Peru. He came back with a lot of books. He went to to to, Colum to Bogota to buy books, and then uh, we went together to Villa Gloria, which is a little house, and I spent two months together there. He was writing the invisible landscape. I was helping to correct the 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 time wave, you know, the the quantification of the I Ching, and then he was talking and talking and talking, and I and I was uh, very eager because I had been always interested in, for the first in philosophy and in big things. The other thing is I was always interested in foreigners <laughs> which means <laughs> in the other always interested in the other and for me Terence was somebody else you know uh, other another and uh, uh, when I was a child they uh, when they asked me what do you want to be when you grow up I used to say that I want to be a foreigner never uh, realized that I was going to be forever a foreigner because I left Colombia when I was 18 and never went back Never went back except for, you know, short trips, you know. In fact, I was there uh, just uh, three weeks ago. I left uh, Bogota just in time uh, because of the coronavirus. And uh, I was able to bring my son, who was a chance student in Bogota, right in time, 48 hours before they closed the border. So now my son is here in, 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 uh, in Florianopolis, in uh, Wasiwaska, and uh, we are going through uh, this uh, period of quarantine here in Brazil. Best place because we are surrounded by plants. We have an ethnobotanical garden of about 400 species. Dale Millar, a South African naturalist, is here with us as well. And, they are, and we are connected with people from all over the world because we have had people here from nearly 50 countries through 20 years. We were going to celebrate 20 years anniversary uh, uh, in, in now, <laughs> well, we are celebrating 20 years. I don't hear you. I don't hear you. I don't hear you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Okay, and okay, we'll okay. Take a moment no. to get this figured out. Um, Dennis, can you hear me? Okay, so Dennis, I'm going to take you off of the stage and then bring you back on, and hopefully that will do something. All right, thank you, everybody. Sounds like we are still having some audio difficulties. Dennis, can you hear me this time? Okay, so we still cannot hear you. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm gonna take you off of the screen and if you could close out your browser and reset and then start again. Um, so Luis, we may just have you on for a few moments. Um, okay, if fine, you wanna fine. continue, thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, well, so I was saying that now uh, we are spending this time here in Wasiwaska. In fact, it's our home with my, my wife, Brazilian wife, Adriana Rosa. Now very happy to have my son here and his uh, uh, partner, uh, Valena, who is 
pregnant of my very first uh, grandchild. You know, I'm very happy about it. So a good place to be here, seeing what is happening in the world and, and right here, because, because it's happening right here, also in Florianopolis. So we are 20 kilometers away, but it's happening here in, in, in Brazil as well. <clears throat> anyway, since Dennis is out of the picture now, I can tell now I can tell you that Terence has been an extraordinary influence in me, uh, uh, to the point that, uh, in a way, in a way, this project here uh, was conceived many many years ago when we were back in in uh, in Colombia in 1980 uh, 1971. Uh, we already talked about at that time about creating a, a botanical garden uh, uh, and I always wanted to have a place where I will have my friends uh, from so many many disciplines and so on and so in a way this this project is in a way was conceived by uh, talking to to Terence back in, in yeah 71 and 73 when I was in Berkeley visiting him no again I cannot hear you, Dennis. Terrible. Uh. Thank you so much, Luis, and everyone okay. in um, and everyone in the crowd. Um, I think if if you don't mind continuing, we're so grateful to have you here, sharing these memories and experience. Um, and it's wonderful in the meantime of figuring out these technical difficulties. So if you want to go ahead and we'll, thanks for being patient while we toggle Dennis on and off to get this figured out. Okay. All right. So I met uh, Terence 71. I, wa I was, I spent two months with him in Berkeley, 1973. Uh, there, that's the time when I discovered the work of Rachel Dolmatov and Schultes and Peter Forst and Michael Harner and all this. So, so I spent my my days in Berkeley uh, uh, buying books during the day, the secondhand books, very cheap, and playing ping pong in the evenings or and and then in the late evenings uh, with Terence and uh, friends he had from many disciplines. Uh, uh, we were watching Watergate uh, at the time, and there was always a joint around and. So very interesting time, uh, 73. Um, then uh, then uh, in uh, 1979, well, 71, I had my, uh, so, so, sorry, 79, I went to Yurayako to see Dona Polinar again. Ah, I forgot to say, uh, during the time we were in Villa Gloria, we took it head together for the first time. It was the first time for both of us and Erika was there, and it was also a, a Hungarian, Carman, Carlos, we call him, Carman Sabo, uh, who uh, got uh, the Yahe from Apolinar. So the first time that we took Yahe together, uh, there was no shaman there. It was just the four of us, we took the Yahe. And uh, I had my first experience, which is compared to what happened, you know, my experiences later on, it was very mild but enough to put me on the track. You know, what is this? What is happening? I never, never had experienced something like this before. And, and then I, when I was in 73 in Berkeley, um, Terence gave me the book uh, by Rachel Dolmatov, Amazonian Cosmos, uh, which he's uh, pointing out the importance of Yahé among the Tucano and the Barasana and other and yes, and I wrote to Rajat Dolmatov, and he was kind, incredible. He was kind enough to reply. And the, then he told me, if you are interested in these things, the best you can do is study science of some sort, you know, so biology or botany or, or chemistry, uh, you know, or uh, anything that will uh, somehow um, make me not to uh, um, be taken away by speculation and uh, give me some kind of discipline and that's what i did you know so i, I was i moved to norway uh, i i studied uh, some chemistry and um, uh, 
he even took courses in astronomy and mathematics. He was uh, uh, difficult to get in, but I got in finally. And when I was very enthusiastic about study science, I was teaching at the same time literature at the, uh, the uh, Oslo University. My colleague said, you, you know, you don't seem to be interested in, in our field, you know, so you're more interested in going, you know, science. So I said, OK, I'm sorry, I will. I took one year of linguistics. Um, um, pure linguistics, and and then I wrote the thesis uh, in literature. But then, when the time came, and uh, there was a position uh, ready, uh, free, it was given to a Norwegian. And then I realized, I mean, there is no future for me in Norway. And and then I I tried to. Uh, I, so one of my colleagues told me go to the Spanish embassy. Uh, apparently, they are looking for a teacher, Spanish teacher in Finland. So I went there and uh, called the person in, in, in charge. And it was at the Swedish School of Economics in Helsinki. There is a minority of 300,000 Swedish speaking people in Finland, uh, fin, uh, fin, Finland, Finland's you know, they call. And um, um, I got the job. <laughs> the funny thing is that all these synchronicities, you know, like there is a story behind it seems, you know. Um, um, when I started to write my doctoral dissertation, I was looking for the work of Rafael Karsten. Uh, Rafael Karsten was a Swedish-Finnish um, um, sociologist at the time. He was not an anthropology. He was, uh, you know, um, he was he was in the department of sociology, head of the department of sociology. And anyway, he was the first one who did field work in uh, Ecuador among the Shuar. And he is the very we have the very first description about Natem. Or, you know, which is the Yahweh, well, is the combination of an instead of Kp and uh, and uh, probably not even Cicotria or Diplopterus, but um, I forgot now the, the name I have is growing here outside the house. Um, it would come to me, uh, but anyway, it was the first description that we have of a ceremony of Yahweh ceremony or a Natem ceremony uh, ever. So I ended up having his position because he was the, the a Spanish lecturer at the Swedish School of Economics in, in the 30s. So by chance, you know, being born in the Colombian Amazon, going to Spain to study, going to Norway, and then ended, uh, ended up in Helsinki, having the job of the very first person who wrote about uh, these things, you know. Uh, it was published in, the, he was in the 20s there. It was published in the, 40, in the 40s, I think, the book. Anyway. They, uh, Dennis, where are you? Thank you again, Luis. It's it's okay. amazing to get to hear these these moments in history. And thank you again to everyone. We're still working through some technical difficulties. Um, again, thank you all for being so fluid with this process. I think that collectively we're really in a state of learning how do we respond to new circumstances and connect with each other uh, virtually in a time when we're not used to doing that to start with and most of these programs aren't used to having this level of traffic on them so really appreciate you all um i would say luis if you'd like to continue for a little while we're still um working on getting dennis's audio back on okay. the same thank you so uh, much you. okay right. wait we'll i'm here you can you hear me okay oh. finally wait. yes can I you can hear me. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to touch anything. I don't know what is. Don't going touch on. anything. Thank you so much, Dennis and Luis. Thank you for. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is terrible. Right? Okay. Okay. So let's see. I have been following the thread. You know. So hang on a second. <laughs> it went so smooth last night you know yeah, i yeah. guess we uh i guess we got uh complacent so can you still hear me yes oh okay okay so uh how does I just there are some things I wanted to ask you some a few talking points, if you will. Okay. 
what how do you think how has terence's legacy impacted contemporary culture you have any uh, thoughts on that okay you know uh, it's very interesting you see contemporary culture i was recently in bogota three weeks ago uh, i was going to give a talk at the, at the department of anthropology of universidad de los andes which is among the best in colombia i went to the and my my talk was canceled three hours before because of the coronavirus so but i was with the anthropologist the department of anthropologists and none of them had even heard the name Terence McKenna. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so world culture, you know, so we are talking about, you know, okay. Uh, I don't know how many, how many people in the world now knows about Terence McKenna and, you know, uh, I don't know, the, the, let's call the psychedelic community. It is dispersed all over the world, but still, you know, it is not something which is so obvious, at least. Perhaps in California it is, you know, and, and then in other places, you know, I mean, I must say, uh, remember that I, some years ago, three or years ago, I think I was invited to give a talk at the, one of these um, um, events, you know, uh, with young people, loud music, uh, what is it called, one of these rapes, you know, um, in Hungary, and um, the moment I said the word Terence McKenna, McKenna, it was just like a magnet. You know, suddenly everybody was, you know, very, very aware, you know, of the name. So mm -hmm. in some places, yes, very well known. In other places, not so much. Certainly in myself and in the people, wonderful people that you have invited, I'm, I was very impressed with Bruce, you know, I mean, his talk, it was amazing, you know. Uh, uh, I'm already a fan, you know, I mean, by the, what, what I heard, you know, I know very little of his work. I'm, I'm going to look for it. Uh, but it was um, certainly he has influenced Bruce. He has influenced uh, Rupert uh, Sheldrake, uh, uh, certainly many other people that I know. So there is a, a segment, segment in society, you know, in the Western society and with some other people here and there who had, uh, Terence had a great impact. And I think that Bruce said it so beautifully. It is uh, triggering, you know, ac accepting imagination is absolutely part of the story. And, and that's something that I've heard also, uh, that I have um, experienced through my ayahuasca and all this, you know. It is, there is a whole realm, another realm, which is parallel, or many, many realms parallel to this reality. And, 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 and so, and including the dream, the dream world and all this, you know. So we have to navigate this, this physical reality within the context of these other, many other worlds which are around us and very accessible. Sometimes, as Bruce said, without anything, just paying attention. Right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, whatever we're experiencing, it's being filtered through our nervous systems, you know. So in some way, you know, experience itself is a is a construct of the mind and, and these these substances just let you alter the frequency a little bit, you know, or right, sometimes right. profoundly, right? Right? Yeah. So you, your whole life and career in some ways uh, stems from that chance encounter in, in the cantina in Florencia. Yes. You know, and yes. you were on a track, I... I have not been listening to the total of your thread because I've been trying to work out these audio problems. But, but you were you were set to go to the seminary in Spain. That that ah, was but that your... was before that was before I met Terence. I was in the seminar. Yes, yes. I, I was in the seminar and left the seminar more because uh, because of uh, the um, because of all these restrictions, intellectual <laughs> restrictions. You know, mm -hmm. There was, a, you know, we were living in the time of the index, you know, the forbidden books, you know. Uh, I became a librarian in the monastery, so I was able to read whatever I wanted, you know, without asking permission anybody, you know. But then the restrictions, you know, they were too much for me. So yeah. I left the seminar. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you, were all, you were already falling away from the faith, as it oh, were, absolutely. before you absolutely. met Terence. You were <laughs> yeah, looking yes, yes. Uh, for the next big... <laughs> 
the next direction and perhaps he <laughs> right right uh, absolutely he, he so, provided that so how yeah. has this influenced your your career what i mean when you when you think about terence's impact of course we've all you, you know of all the people that we're we're interviewing during this series you actually have known terence the, the longest, longest. You know, you've known him longer than you've known me, and I feel like we've known each other for many years. But I didn't meet him till I didn't meet you till ten years later. You actually right, met right. Prince in 1971, in the year yes. of the event. You right. know, so how is that influenced your him. Your And career? I was with him in 1973, because remember, that's the right. Time wave zero was supposed the the end or you know the end of history or the ingression of the, the you know the infinite novelty was supposed to happen uh, uh, December twenty first nineteen seventy three. That's right. That's yes. right. And I was in July. I was with Terence in Berkeley, and that was was when when Coho take the 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 comet you know had a, a perihelion on the twenty first uh, of December and and the and and the, the central part of the eclipse was going through uh, over Belém do Pará in Brazil. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Terence was saying, that's it, that's it, you know, <laughs> it's going, it is going to happen, you know. And uh, the funny thing is that when I, I was then living in Norway, I went back to Norway and the plaza, you know, in, in, in the main square, they were all covered with uh, 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 papers uh, with the UFOs and Jesus and the end of the world, you know, <laughs> because of Coho Tech, you know, so, right. so it was just like, say, wow, this is really right. happening, you know. <laughs> so. And, and Coho Tech, too, is another one of these things that turned out to be kind of a non event. It was very, very right, disappointing right. when it finally came up. I think it's interesting it was, that it was like that, a joke, you know, it was yeah, like a joke, the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there were many instances. Well, Terence was, you know, the the actual end date of the time wave was a matter of speculation, and and he <laughs> evaluated many possible end dates, and then finally settled on a, an end date in I think it was November twenty uh, twenty twelve, and then found out about the Mayan calendar. So it was just a my, minor <laughs> tweak, in just a couple of weeks, and we were talking about cycles of. Literally billions of years, you know. Yeah, what's right. what's a few days either either way, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, but it was it was great fun, great fun, because there was also a very nice way to to study history. You know, you have some, some graph and say what happened here, what happened there, and you are jumping in history, and that's giving you something, you know. Because at the end, now we are in a situation with the Anthropocene, and now even more with this virus, in which we can see, you know, our history. In, in, in a big way, you know, like we never were able to do it before, thanks to all the information we have. I mean, so, you know, so so now we are able to have a, a big picture and even a bigger picture than 20 years ago, of course, you know. I was listening mm -hmm. to this, uh, this um, um, uh, looking at this video with Terence talking about the Amazon and being populated with very few people that has been completely, you know, you know, Terence had, even though we speculated, you know, I remember having conversations with Terence that perhaps, you know, the Mesoamerican civilization and the and the South American civilization came from the Amazon. You know? But still, you know, then then we found out that wow, the Amazon was heavily populated. You, we have big, you know, huge uh, uh, and and extremely extremely um, sophisticated. In terms of pharmacology, in terms of uh, plant knowledge, you know, you know, right. so they didn't have big cities, you know, but they have, they have, they have knowledge of how to, you know, um, modify your consciousness. The great, the great uh, experts in in the science of consciousness were the Amazonians. Yes, and of course, all this knowledge is in danger because the 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 people that are the stewards of this knowledge are are threatened uh, their habitats their ecosystems are threatened the plants are in danger um i there's a great deal of pressure on ayahuasca right now from over harvesting i mean and and so what do you think you 
may have, you know, your publication of your book may have contributed to the, uh, you know, the rise of, of global interest in ayahuasca and uh, other things did too. Uh, not that you're at fault for that. I'm not even sure it's a bad thing, but what's your perspective? I mean, why did ayahuasca suddenly come out of the Amazon and become a global phenomenon? I mean, in part, certainly part of it had to do with the fact that, you know, it escaped. I mean, it escaped to Hawaii. Terence and I essentially liberated it to Hawaii. But I took the Sakotrias to Hawaii. I took the Sakotrias to Hawaii. You brought the Sakotrias to Hawaii and yeah, also right. many of the Banisteriopsis that, that, yeah, yeah, that we so, have so, there. So, so but yes. what is your perspective on the, the on ayahuasca as a global phenomenon? I mean, it is. is is this a good it is, thing? It is so big and it is difficult to, to you know, because uh, I have seen, met a lot of people who have been transformed, completely transformed by one or two experiences. You know, yeah. I think that the problem is the commodization, the people who are, you know, boasting, you know, I took 500 times ayahuasca. I, took, you know, I mean, why, you know, I mean, uh, you know, in, 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 in the moment it becomes a commodity, something that you take again and again, and you believe that you are getting better and better because you drink this thing, you know. I mean, it, it depends what happens with with you, how it changes your personal life. And I met many, many people who, whose life had changed for the positive in many, many different ways, you know, including myself. You know, I think that, uh, that uh, what ayahuasca has been given me most important is this sensitivity towards nature, you know, I mean, animism, animism, you know, that's, that's for me the most important. And animism, not as a philosophy, not as an abstract thing, it's not a, you know, intellectual conversation. Animism is about direct, intimate knowledge with the natural world. And then, because you, when you have that contact, then intelligence is there, obviously, it's, you know, you can see it. You know, you can see it, you can feel it, you can, you know, there is no doubt, you know, and so. Right. Yeah. It, it's not something you can conceptualize. You can conceptualize no. it, but that's different than experiencing it. Right, right. And I think that's what ayahuasca does. It gives, I, I think that ayahuasca brings the background forward. I've often said this about psychedelics, that there are always things going on in the background that we are programmed not to notice because they're not relevant to our immediate survival. But psychedelics can, can, can you can have permission to step out of your reference frame and, and look at what's going on in the background. And I think this state of consciousness is very similar to an indigenous person's state of consciousness. I think that they are kind of always there. You know, we have to take ayahuasca to get there, but that's the world right. they live in. And as wonderful as literacy is, I think that literacy kind of interposes a barrier between this right. direct experience. And this is, you know, when we're all Western educated, literate people, even if we don't read books anymore, we still have that, that perspective. So that, so you know, what would come naturally to an indigenous person who doesn't have the impediments of civilization is a skill or a knowledge that we have to learn. And these plant teachers can, that's how we can learn them. What, what, what's yes. your, what is your, when I say plant teacher, you, you wrote a paper about the plant yeah, I teacher, wrote the, you studied vegetalismo. How do you view this now? How do you view the way that the people in the in the vegetalismo tradition viewed plant teachers, and and how do you relate to that concept? Well, um, I mean, for me, it is not any longer an abstract. It's not an abstract concept. You know, it is a. It is uh, based on on experience in a way, and and uh, I I mean I do I do it's not believe it, it is it is it is there it is an obvious thing so so you tap now the problem is when we take a plant teacher you know we try uh, we always try to 
anthropomorphize everything. You know, the plant teacher has to be what you know. Uh, it's it's an entity, entities, entities. You know, I mean, simply is the is the door into so many other entities out there. You know, or everything alive, everything intelligent, mind and body. Uh, uh, you know, mind and, and and matter being in a way one. You know, and I think that that right. is the shamanic uh, shamanic way of seeing things. And I'm thinking that what is happening right now with the virus and all this, I don't know, perhaps this is an opportunity. I was, you know, I've been talking a, a lot, you know, at conferences about, about animism and how, you know, intelligence in nature. And I'm in very in touch with very good friends, Jeremy Narby, Monica Galliano, who have been, you know, Monica, a real scientist who is telling us that what, you know, the, the experiments he made were like, in a way like given you know, by the plants, those spoke the plant, you know. Uh, so, so I can see that, that, that it is a reality. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, you talk to, to this, how can normal people understand animism? You know, what does it matter, you know, uh, in a world where we are full of distractions all, all the time? But mm -hmm. suddenly this happened. Suddenly, I think that now this is the moment where perhaps people are going to pay attention to some ideas. So I see it as a fantastic opportunity to bring, you know, this idea and many others, you know, of course, you know, but is that that we are not, a, a, you know, the most uh, advanced species on, on this planet. I mean, now we have a, the little virus is just causing havoc, you know, and it's one of the many to come perhaps, you know. So we are not, we are not the top of creation, but, yes. we, have the, but we have this, uh, you know, we have learned so much about where we are that this is a fantastic opportunity to, in a way, mix, you know, what science has taught us and what animism, you know, animistic societies are giving us and blend the, the two of them. And, you know, so there is a, perhaps an opportunity. Right. Yeah, I think I think you're, you're exactly right. That it is that the coronavirus is giving us a tremendous opportunity to again reflect and bring back the focus to what ayahuasca has been pounding into our heads ever since we've been taking it which is that we monkeys are not running this show and we are not even necessarily the most intelligent species on the earth we, we the like thing. to arrogate <laughs> that to us because right. we have these big brains and these complex nervous systems and these hands and you know that that manipulate the environment and and in some very cynical way you could say that all those things have given us better tools to screw things up right. <laughs> you know other species are not driven to do that and i mean yeah nor nor could they because they don't have they don't have that mindset you know i often say in my talks that uh you know ayahuasca is a way it's a catalyst for waking us up you know, I mean, and that, that's why it's escaped from its Amazonian home and moved across the world. We think this is that we're doing this, you know, and in part we are. I mean, we've we partnered with we, meaning the human species, has partnered with ayahuasca to spread it across the globe. But I don't think it necessarily originated with us, you know, plants what plants like to do is spread they want to move into new you know new niches and ayahuasca i think that uh, gaia is getting a little bit nervous actually quite nervous about the fact that the monkeys are not listening the monkeys are not waking up to what's happening so she sends out her ambassadors right. which are these teacher plants you know and and i'm anthropomorphizing this whole thing you yeah, don't yeah. really have that's a way to look at it but you can you yeah. can take that element out of it and just say this is the you know gaia is a concept for something that this planetary size homeostatic system that is a living thing i mean by all it's a super organism that's a that's a popular word now it's a super organism made up of all organisms on on the planet and it acts in an intelligent way to uh, optimize conditions for survival which would include eliminating or certainly uh, 
you know, interfering with species like us that are that are actually a threat to the continuance of of Gaia. <laughs> and yet, you know, the I mean, it's interesting. Gaia, you know, I sense there's a certain compassion in Gaia. You know, it sends ayahuasca to try to convey a message that, you know, you monkeys need to wake up or it sends mushrooms or it sends the coronavirus, you know, which sends a different kind of message. And it's hard to think of the coronavirus as a benevolent, a benevolent influence, but actually it may be, you know, we're waking up to a whole bunch of things that we haven't woken up to before. So as a catalyst for waking up, the coronavirus is perhaps more effective than ayahuasca. Right, right, right. Ayahuasca I mean, only gets to a, a small number of people. Coronavirus uh, speaks to everyone and right. more or less forces us to wake up. Right. Yes. What we do with that realization, once we have made it, is uh, I guess the $64 question right now. Where do we go from here? Uh, there you are, Genevieve. Well, um, does it mean that it is over? <laughs> means that. Uh, thank you, you both go so to much. Some questions, We're moving right? into the oh, okay. question, question and answer yeah, section. Yeah. And right, right. This has been an amazing yeah, conversation yeah. so far. Thank you both. Um, and kind of going along in that vein, um, I'd like to ask a question about what are your thoughts on ayahuasca tourism? Me or Denise? Um, I'm sure you both first. of you would have something. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. you know. Good, good uh, question. Thing, yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, well, you know, the last time I was in the, in the, in Iquitos was uh, the year 2000, uh, 2000, I think. I was, I went with you, De Dennis. I think uh, Alan Shoemaker invited us to the, to his very first meeting there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, for me, it was, uh, it was a shock, you know, because, because uh, I had been there, okay, it's an, it's not in the Peruvian Amazon, 1980, you know, I met Don Emilio, made the film, Don Emilio and his little doctors, which by the way, you can, you can find in YouTube. Is, I yes. think that is the, this is the very first ayahuasca film. Yes. And, uh, and, and I, I might add, probably one of the best documentaries on ayahuasca made because it's, Cinematographically, it's very amateurish, but the message is important. I just, Don Emilio and his little doctors, go to YouTube and watch it sometime. Anyway, go on. Okay, so. To highlight that. And, and then uh, from 1995 and on, I worked mostly in, with Pablo. I mean, uh, you know, we created a school of painting. I was putting all my energy, organizing things in a way. So I, I didn't. You know, I will say that I will stop. I stopped doing my, the, the field work, let's call it this way. You know, I'm a vegetalist, as I took a, eventually from time to time with one or another, but but I put my energy more in in Pablo's work and the school of painting for several years, many years, in fact. You know, so so in the year 2000, I went back to that conference and the bus took, took us to Guillermo Arevalo's place to take a, a bus full of you know people from all over the world mm -hmm. and, and 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 then it was huge you know number of people taking it and i i was uh, i was amazed appalled almost you know because also the, the the you know a lot for a lot of people was very important but for 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 many of them it's simply you know it's just a, a a tourist trip you know it's just i i, I you know they could they could say to the friends I was in the Amazon. I took ayahuasca. You know, it, it was more. You know, so so I don't know. I don't know what to think. There are so for some people have been so absolutely important, changed their lives in the positive way. For for others have been just a commodity, just one more thing that they did. You know, in order to impress their friends. You know, so 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 I don't know. But still, yeah. I think that the positive is there because the lot of people. You know, do are doing great things. Many ideas, new ideas, and especially in the arts, you know, and the music, and 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 also the ideas. I mean, you know, I, I know that they has influenced a lot of thinkers. You know, some great people, or many of our friends, of course. 
Yeah, the ayahuasca tourism, I mean, it's such a complex issue. In many ways, we know that sometimes that the ad that the impact of ayahuasca tourism on the indigenous <laughs> communities or mestizo communities can be it's a two-edged sword you know it brings economic activity into these communities which may or may not be a benefit there are and and the there's the whole spectrum of people that seek the experience i think that people by and large who go to south america to take ayahuasca they're not thrill seekers and there are some i suppose who want to be able to say well i did ayahuasca i did the neck i did the hip fashionable thing and took ayahuasca i think many more people are are sincerely motivated by a desire for meaningful experience you know, yes. which has been taken out of our society. I mean, our religions are hollowed out shells of what they're supposed to be. They don't provide any spiritual sustenance, really. They provide a set of rules that you're supposed to follow, and they don't give, you know, much guidance. And, and I, I think people are rejecting that, and yet they still want that genuine spiritual experience. And, and yes. you know, and they go in search of it. Now, you know, in their search, they may be insensitive to how disruptive this can be for those cultures. It's, it's inevitable. I mean, you can't yeah. fence these cultures off. You can't, you know, put them on reservations. I, I view this thing as a part of the co-evolutionary process. That's how, that's how I explain it to myself, maybe justify it to myself. If you look at it from that perspective, we are involved in a very long-term co-evolutionary symbiosis with this plant. And we've been involved in that for nobody knows how long, at, at least thousands of years this is a stage in that you know in that it's it has moved out of its ancestral home and now it's operating globally partly as a reflection of the urgency that people get its message that people you know and and that's the thing that's the thing you can the important thing with any psychedelic is what happens between the person uh, who experiences the medicine and it needs to happen in a context, you know, and that may be a thera therapeutic context, it may be a traditional shamanic context, any of these things. But, the, but what really goes on, the teaching, if you will, of the plant teachers is one-on-one. -on -one. It's between the yeah. person and the medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an important message and people can internalize that and perhaps change their lives and go home and and make changes and and you see this happening ayahuasca tourism is not going to go away what i would like to see happen eventually i i'm i'm encouraged by these decriminalization movements that are happening in the states on the municipality level because what that may lead to is virtually, well, in the first place, the idea that you could criminalize any plant is absurd on the face of it. You know, I mean, this is just a reflection of the arrogance we have about nature and our presumption that we own it. You know, so that's something we need to get disabused of. But I think that, um, you know, I think that these decriminalization movements are very encouraging because it opens up the possibility instead of people coming to South America to take the medicine, you might be able to bring the medicine to North America because there are all these centers right now that exist in almost every community, but they're underground. They're technically illegal. If they could step out of the shadow and actually operate in the open you could reverse the equation and without mm -hmm. impact you know and and i think that would be much better and you could benefit the indigenous people because they would be producing this material getting economic benefit from that but not having crazy gringos tromp all over their villages and their traditions and so on or there would be less of that there would be less yeah, of that right, right. so maybe that's a good uh, direction that 
this thing could go because ayahuasca and these plants mushrooms and ayahuasca primarily the others but ayahuasca is now part of the global conversation and uh it's not going to go away you know and and so we have to learn how to integrate our use of these plant teachers ayahuasca mushrooms iboga you know into our society in a respectful way that that respects their traditions and yet also speaks to post 20th century modern people you know this this is the challenge how do we combine these these ancient traditions with our current uh global global consciousness global mindset this is the challenge anyway much could be said about ayahuasca tourism that's for sure thank you dennis for that i, I really appreciate that perspective um and luis uh we do have several questions that follow along that same vein um that dennis almost answered towards the end here and i'm wondering if you might be able to follow up um, there's a question about, can you talk about sustainability, indigenous stewardship, and world opposing cosmologies? Um, just to really piggyback on the end of that last question. Uh, you mean sustainability of ayahuasca or, or, uh, or in the, general? The question doesn't state that, but I would imagine uh, okay. there's some things to be okay. said about well, ayahuasca. You know, as well. yeah. We have been doing here some experiments, interesting ones, you know. Um, um, planting, you know, here we have a botanical garden and we're doing some experiments with Dale Millard, the South African naturalist, and we have been planting um, a, a, the vine together with a fast growing tree, like, um, it's, um, um, I don't remember, remember now the, the name. Um, um, we did experiments and we, we came to growing the plant vertically, you know the two species somehow they get along you know ayahuasca could kill it immediately you know but they get along and grow together and they both plants uh, produce a lot of biomass and so this biomass is accumulating at the bottom and what a way to recover uh, you know lands poor land you know the, the trapped by by cattle to mm -hmm. recover recover uh, you know the topsoil and we and these are uh, you could plant other plant uh, other trees as well so you know so it could be a, a, a process of of uh, you know uh, um, recovering land and giving work to a lot of people in the amazon uh, uh, yes. it will take some years five six years you right. know, but still you know it will be possible and now we know that ayahuasca the is not so, it's not only don't think about only about the visions and you know but in seriopsis independently of dmp you know plants you know like Chicotra and diplopteros it's a extraordinary medicine by itself mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and so so if it, it will be possible to establish this kind of of markets you know of of a plant which is not scheduled because that doesn't uh, doesn't produce dmt you could make extracts of banisteriopsis and, uh, you know, for, for many different illnesses, in fact, you know, um, in the book that you publish, um, uh, Dennis, from the Turingham uh, talks, there is an article by uh, uh, Dave Millar with all the properties of Harbin. I mean, it's amazing. It's a, mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. so, so that, there is a possibility of combining the interest in these plants with economic development and including the indigenous people, you know, who are losing their land so fast. I mean, especially here in Brazil, this is this is obscene. The murder of indigenous leaders that taking the, their land uh, for gold extraction for I mean, it is a tragedy. I used to say, you know, 1492 is going on to this day. 1492, which was for me historically the big biggest change, you know, in history, mm -hmm. it's going on to our very day here. You know, we you, we can see it here the. The, the 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 Indians here in the uh, on the island of Santa the few ones you know on on, on this island you know they are in terrible uh, situation you know uh, they are invisible they are, now in the coronavirus they, there is no help to them you know they you know indigenous people can die out in this epidemic you know like flies you know and um, so 
it, 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 so I see that it's very urgent that we have to take the side of the indigenous people. We need them. We need them more than ever. Yes. We need their knowledge. We need their attitude more than We're, ever. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, what's going on in Brazil is also reflects what's going on in the United States. I think much of it comes down to the fact that these are essentially criminal regimes. You know, I mean, let's call them what they are. Bolsonaro's policies are government endorsed genocide. That's the policy that indigenous people are subhuman and therefore can be wiped out without any you know, they see no value in their knowledge and in their traditions. Absolutely. Well, and so ayahuasca is a way perhaps to slow that down. You know, I, I, I think that, and, and as you point out, the prop, you know, ayahuasca itself, the vine, we're suddenly discovering, or not suddenly, but over the last few years, we've discovered many, many medicinal properties that it has that are not even related to its use as a psychedelic. You know, this is a right. valuable medicine. And it's just remarkable to me. Here you've got a plant that's been studied chemically, pharmacologically, ever since it was discovered, 150 years of now, and we're still learning new things from this. Right, right. So I think part of the solution, part of the solution to sustainability is obvious grow more ayahuasca grow it everywhere that that you can and also and many other plants and many other plant teachers yeah. and many other so yeah, re is, reforest yeah, reforestation yeah. programs which are now you will see more and more of those as as the amazon gets depleted reforestation programs should just as a fundamental <clears throat> include the planting of ayahuasca and the admixture plants as part of the understory and it just be should be included in any kind of reforestation program there is a lot of pressure on these on these plants right now you know and especially the old vines so there needs to be some way to manage this that is not the colonialists coming in and telling people how they're going to do it it's got to be a, a grassroots kind of kind of movement and people have to realize the the value of the of the resource that they've been stewards of for so long and and let them manage it but but create a framework so that there's not this over harvesting uh and i'm not sure you know and and reversing the equation essentially saying ayahuasca is a sacred medicine like oakland have, has done like other municipalities have done they've just legalized these psychedelic plants across the board so now that opens a way for to reverse the flow you know bring the medicine to north america and that's where it's needed and send the money south to the people that are producing it and the, you know we're in this uh we're in this transitional state now but maybe in a few years that will happen. Um, and, and so I'm hopeful at the same time, I'm worried that it's being depleted much, you know, much too quickly and people need it, you know, not just indigenous people, the world needs it. Humanity. I, I mean, ayahuasca is a gift to humanity, you know, and, uh, it's a gift from Gaia. The indigenous people are the stewards of it, but I don't think they they would assert ownership. They don't even relate to their environment in those terms. You know, they have nurtured it. They've been the stewards of it. How can we respect that and still get its message out to the to the rest of the world? Because the rest of the world needs needs it. They needs it for this waking up process that must go on if we're going to save ourselves. Thank you both so much. Um, this is such a potent and important topic as we move into this time in the world where we're all trying so hard to wake up and, and shift culture in this way. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm gonna bring in a question um, on the Icaros. The question is, what are your thoughts on the Amazonian perspective 
on how might the Ikaro, specifically the cadence, rhythm, and etymology of the words sung by the maestro as a medium for plant symbiosis, how might these aid in cleaning or helping to heal a patient or participant from a given illness stemming from psychological, physiological, or in the case of Amerindian cosmology, a magical illness such as soul fragmentation of spirit intrusion? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, part of it I will answer, you know, but uh, but anyway, okay, first, a very good opportunity to have over 2,000 people here online. Uh, when I he hear somebody, even a shaman, say Icaro, I, I know that they have been influenced by the Western because it is pronounced Icaro. Oh, Icaro. 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 Icaro is to sing a song to give power to whatever, you know, to tobacco, or to, you know, that's Icararo. Icara, you know, you can, you can Icarar your tobacco, you can Icarar a person, you know, so, so you are giving, you know, and so, so it is. So, so the Indicaros in the Amazon, in, in the tradition I was studying, um, um, these are given by the plants, you know, I mean, during the, the you know, you get the, the, the songs, you know. And, uh, and these songs are very effective to the point that, uh, for instance, when I was with the uh, 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 Chipibo, um, in, uh, I spent a month doing the diet there. And um, I asked, oh, I forgot now the name of my teacher. It's terrible. Uh, um, I asked him, um, where are the plants? Because I was collecting plants, you know. I was collecting plants and, and say, where are the plants? And then he told me, if you know the song of the plant, you don't need the plant. The songs will do it, you know. So, uh, so the uh, the whole healing in the Shibibo tradition is these songs, you know. Not only the songs, but giving the, the perfumes and the and the scents, you know. It's a very aesthetic way of of healing, you know. You hear these beautiful songs and good smell and all these, and this gives you peace and. You know, it helps the you know the the the, the healing. You know, Don Basilio, Don Basilio Gordon was uh, my Chipibo teacher for uh, a month. I spent uh, uh, with him in Santa Rosa de Pirococha in on the Ucayali River. Um, so yes, but um, um, but I myself I found out that um, okay, the Icaros are beautiful, uh, powerful, etc. You know. But you can do a lot with recorded music as well. You know, you can, uh, you, you know, music by itself can take you to many, many interesting places, you know, uh, so, so that it is not necessary in a way. Or other instruments, or people, you know, playing music in the ayahuasca season, all, all this the music is very important, very important. In fact, the, the, the Siona said that, that to take your hair and not to sing, you know, it's impossible. It is, it's part of it. The music is part of it. Uh, so, so, yeah, so uh, extremely important, extremely important. Um, um, but uh, as I said, it's music in general, not only Icaros. Icaros, you know, uh, uh, beautiful, powerful. There are some uh, shamans have beautiful Icaros, but now in the, in the Amazon, you hear the same Icaro sung in different ways, you know, by different people, uh, uh, you know, so it's originally, is the originally, uh, the Icaros are given to you by the plants. And, and so originally, at least what I was doing my full work, uh, every vegetalista, every will have his own Icaros and you don't sing the Icaro of somebody else. But then even in, in, in the Amazon, then you started to see uh, vegetalistas who want the, the, the people to sing together. It, that is like the beginning of the uh, formation of religion in a way. You know, I've seen it happen in there as well. In, mm. in, in Brazil, it happened very, very clearly, you know, but also in Peru, you see that some kind, you know, the, the songs of somebody and, you know, so, yeah. So there are many, many possibilities there. It's a, a, there is a beautiful, beautiful um, a doctoral thesis by Susana Bustos a Chilean anthropologist who lives in the Bay Area uh, about the Icaros and the feeling. It's a phenomenological study of Icaros and what people perceive, 
field and safety, patients or the people uh, participated in the ceremony. Very interesting. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, that is a beautiful explanation. And thank you so much for the correction on the pronunciation. Um, so it looks like we've got about six minutes left. Um, so I'm wondering, there's a question here, uh, Luis, if you could talk about the Wasi Waska Institute. Um, it says, it seems like a very interesting place. I live here. I'm a student oh, yeah. of biology in UFSC. Um, you're a reputed professor there in the Department of Anthropology. Can you tell more about those times of being a professor and about the institute? Okay, well, I, I was before I was in Vasca, created was in Vasca, I was teaching here at the, at the Universidad de Federal de Santa Catarina, four and a half years, which I was a first visiting professor and then a professor in anthropology. Uh, but it was during that time that I had the idea you know, about a piece of land and I had the idea to build a place where I will invite my friends and have a botanical garden. And in fact, what Terence and I, we were talking about so many years ago, you know, he did it in Hawaii on an island and I did it here in another island uh, in the south. Uh, so so in a way, his spirit is, is here. So this is a place that I, I created. Uh, uh, we have a botanical garden, a botanical garden, as I said, a good library, 4,000 books, uh, uh, but then I have been invited here, extraordinary people through the years. We are going to celebrate 20 years, you know, so we have had Dennis uh, many times, Graham Hancock, uh, I mean, uh, Ed Frexka, uh, so many David Nichols, uh, so many interesting, extraordinary people. And my, my, I, uh, for me, I was, it was a place of conversation, dialogues, dialogues you know, history, physics, biology, whatever discipline, we are all getting enriched, you know. So since in a way, uh, I have to give up the university uh, uh, here in Florianopolis, we went back to Finland for personal reasons and uh, to continue being a, a Spanish teacher, you know, a, a Spanish lecturer. Uh, um, um, uh, what I, with Wasiwaska, I wanted to bring, uh, I wanted to bring the university to my home. And that's what has been happening, you know. Uh, extraordinary Rupert was here last year, uh, Bernard Carr, cosmologist, we have extraordinary people. And just this is a tiny, you know, tiny little groups, 10 people, 10, 11 participants, four, five teachers, and we get here together for two weeks, excellent food, organic, you know, because it's part of the healing process and all this. So, so this is a place for dialogues, dialogues of many disciplines and, you know, yes. Wonderful, thank right. you so much. Um, yeah, in in um, many ways, the uh, Wasiwaska is what the McKenna Academy aspires to be. You know, you well, have already done it. You've created what I call a, a catalytic nexus for global consciousness transformation. That's what the McAdam Academy has conceived as being, and that's what Wasiwaska is. You know, and it it's been around twenty years. Yes, you know, indeed. the uh, the only um, drawback, and I'm not sure it is a drawback, but you can only have fairly small groups. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's okay, because the, the best uh, conversations go on in fairly, fairly small groups. So, mm. yeah, you know, exactly. and you have had amazing people there. So I, I highly recommend anyone that wants to have you know, a very edifying learning experience, check it out and, uh, you know, go to Wasiwaska if you can. You will not be disappointed. In the text box, I uh, it scrolled back up, but I did want to mention ICERS, ICERS.org, which is an organization that's doing the best work to address the sustainability issues with ayahuasca and also the the preservation of the indigenous knowledge and also some of the legal issues. They've created <laughs> an ayahuasca legal defense fund for curanderos, vegetalistas, and so on that go to other countries and get run afoul of the law. So check out ICERS. It's an international center for ethnobotanical education, uh, research, and service. And they're a great organization and they deserve your support. So I just want to put a plug in there for ICERS. Thank you for that, Dennis. And that actually brings me to uh, the last question. 
um, following kind of in that in that vein, someone asked um, Dennis, what are your future plans for the McKenna Academy? Well, uh, the future plans are wide open. <laughs> um, I mean, what we're doing, events like this, this is part of fulfilling the mission of the McKenna Academy. The McKenna Academy wants to be a place for education and learning about our place in nature. The full title is Natural Philosophy. It's the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Natural philosophy is what science was before it became reductionist and before it lost, you know, it, 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 in a sense, when natural philosophy evolved into what we now call science, a lot was lost. And perhaps the perception that there are different ways of knowing that are not necessarily quantitative, that don't have to be measured. Now, that's a big part of science, but that's not the whole story. So I'm hoping that the McKenna Academy can be a catalyst for this type of learning. We have ambitions to, uh, I mean, we do work in the Sacred Valley in Peru. We have done retreats and conferences and that sort of thing. And we want to continue that. Eventually, we might be able to uh, make a physical campus for the academy in that region, as Eduardo's done with Wasiwaska. Uh, but now that coronavirus is sort of changing our perspective on all this, we're, you know, we've had to respond to that. We canceled two big symposia we were going to have in San Francisco and had to pivot to the digital side. This is what you're seeing is the response to that. So I think the McKenna Academy is, is it's fulfilling its mission. Please check out the website and, uh, you know, send us feedback. If you want to support it, you can do that. We're a nonprofit. We're going to have uh, be able to offer tax deductions soon. We're going. We're finding a fis fiscal sponsor in the states. We're incorporated in Canada. We're a nonprofit in Canada, where I now live. But we will have uh, a way for people who want to support us and have a tax deduction. We can make that possible. And but please just check out the website and see if you like what we're talking about. It's it's a work in progress. And it's very much about symbiosis and collaboration. So if you have ideas for conferences or projects or other things that you would like to bring bring forth, then we're receptive and open to that. This is something, even though it's got my name on it, it's a collective effort. You know, it's not all about me. In fact, hopefully very little of it is about me. Um, you know, I want to bring the best minds, the most creative people possible together to create this and essentially create the McKenna Academy in as an analog to Eleusis. You know, I want it to be the first psychedelic university in 1500 years. You know, there has not been one that exists since Eleusis was sacked and burned in 396 AD. That's where the psychedelic tradition in Western culture was essentially brought to the ground, essentially stomped out by the state religion of Christianity, which, which was uh, gaining hegemony at that time. Well, we need to bring the mystery schools back. And that's what the McKenna Academy seeks to be, is a modern mystery school with historical roots to Eleusis, but modern, a modern uh, link to institutions like Esalen, for example. Mm -hmm. Think tanks, places where people come and learn to think and learn from each other. And in the case of the Academy, learn from the plant teachers. I sometimes say the McKenna Academy will be the first university where not all the faculty are human. <laughs> so check it out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you for an incredible afternoon touching on so many important topics right now. Um, so I'm just going to let everyone know we are moving towards our breakout session section of the program. 
Um, and just want to remind everybody to come to our following programs on April 11th. We'll have Paul Stamets speaking, as well as Wade Davis. Um, and on April 18th, the following Saturday, we will have Dennis McKenna, Rupert Sheldrake, and also Ralph Abram speaking together. Um, so definitely hey, check Abraham. Out. Ralph Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. And that's going to go from 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time to 4.30 p.m. It's a four and a half hour program on both of these following Saturdays. Um, shortly after this session ends, the replay for uh, all of today will be available through this same link. Um, so you can come back here and check it out. Um, there is a share button for social media, so you can share this with people and it will link them directly back to here. So please let your friends know. Um, also, we are collecting um, people's favorite moments of Terrence. There's a button at the bottom of the screen that says, submit your Terrence favorites. And so if there's a piece of art that really speaks to you or a quote of his, a talk, um, some people have mixed together really amazing music with his words. Um, let us know about it. It's, it's amazing to see the collective ripples reflected back through your contributions. And we'll be posting those on the McKenna Academy website as well as on social media. Um, so let us know what stands out to you. We'd love to hear it. Um, let's see what else we need to go to. I think we are just about ready to move out into the breakout session. Thank you again, everybody, so much. Um, you. One, one question, Genevieve, before we go. I just saw a scroll by. Can people also still watch the uh, last night's event? They can. That's also on the web, and they can go look at that again. Is that right? Yes, definitely. So Crowdcast yeah, okay. is amazing as a platform in that you can um, both view things again, and you can also click on the questions that were asked, and it will uh, bring you directly to that section of the talk. And um, both on this event page here, as well as our Facebook event pages, there are links to both of the different nights. Um, Friday night was its own link, and then the following three Saturdays today and the next two Saturdays can all be accessed through this link here. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. So if you click thank on the you. top of your screen, you should be able to see um, that there are number two breakout sessions. Um, and so I believe there are five of them. So you can go directly into these breakout sessions now to continue the discussion. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Okay. What is the breakout sessions? I don't know. So if you go to the it. top of the screen and select more, you'll see right below this current section. Um, it says mm. breakout number two, acceptance and integration, therapeutic use, recreational use. Um, so people can go right there from this section here. All right, I'm going to bring everyone off screen. Thank you again so much. Okay, okay. thank you. Acceptance, integration, uh, I don't through. see. I don't see it. If you go up, you see something that says schedule.